Good evening. So uh, I'm Jeremy. Uh, this is John. Uh, we work at a company called Jux, and um, we are big fans of functional programming and open source and uh, simple tools. And I'll pass it to John. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, just a point of housekeeping. We've got these T-shirts that we made. Uh, so if anyone wants to grab one, you can. Uh, they are littered around. I'm fairly tempted to throw this one. I'll see what happens. Let's see if we can knock over. You already got one, but then you have to throw it back. You can throw it back next and then the board goes. Awesome. Um, so we're going to talk uh, about five time quality and uh, something that we build in this space called Crux. Has anybody heard of Crux just, just before we start? One person? Right. Two people? Exponentially growing ones. Um, okay, cool. Bitemporality, has anybody heard of bitemporality? Maybe a few more people. Okay, cool. Not yet. That's why we're here. Let's dig in. Cool, okay, uh, let's get going then. So basically, I just want to talk a bit about uh, bitemporality, and then uh, Jeremy will talk about crux. And these effects on our experiences, uh, great to chat to you afterwards and find out what you all think and you know, different opinions. So let's get going. So, uh, we love time. Um, so basically, in my experience, whenever you deal with lots of data, scale, lots of events, you often have the problem of querying across the data set across time, as the time-based queries. So time always comes into it, you can't avoid time. And uh, over the last two years, we've, we've spent our time just thinking about it and enjoying sort of musing on, on time. So, uh, I want to get started with a bit of like a fun exercise. So, this is a table and we add a column called created on. So if you here have done this, you've got a SQL table, and you've added a column that says created on. So I guess that's you know, a good proportion of the people. Good and, sorry? Good practices. Okay, then, gosh, sorry. Um, so this is kind of useful, because it obviously gives some data to the business about how old something is, or to operations people about how old something is. And then they can use it to determine that the piece of data is stale, or maybe it needs to be pushed out, that kind of thing. And it doesn't change, it's like it's stamped, it's immutable, it's there on its row forever. So that's like a useful starting point. And we're getting into time. So now we take this level further and we say, well, now we want to add a new column, which is like, how often does this thing take? When's the last time this row, this entity changed? And uh, this is, gives us more information, it's useful. But notice a couple of things about it, it's kind of error prone because we're mutating it all the time. It's a field that's churning, right? And we're losing data as well. There's interesting data that we're overwriting here, right? The last time it was updated before you write the fact it's just been updated. So some, some issues with this approach. And it might be for regulatory reasons. You, you can't really do this. You have to keep every version of everything around with the same time stamp. And then you get into this sort of complexity. Um, so here it's like, okay, we want to keep everything around, but we have to, to mark when a version of an entity uh, was valid between two dates. And then for any point in time, you can get what something looked like at a particular point in time. So who here has built something like this? So a few people. Cool. So a couple of problems with, with this is that like, it's, it's, it's complex, because now just to get a thing, we have to do a query with date parameters, or maybe we, you know, we admit one if we just want to get the last one. And also, like, um, we've introduced this version ID, this concept of versioning. We might have done that anyway, but now we've been sort of forced to just sort of keep our state around and access it across different points of time. Uh, the biggest problem with this is that it just sprawls out, because you might have lots of tables that have these columns, and then it gets into a bit of a mess, and the queries get complicated, and it doesn't really scale. So, is there a better way? So, we want less friction in our lives. We want, we want to be kinder to time, and time kinder to us. So, uh, one way of not having the previous solution is, is to have this technology or an approach called Azov, which is a point in time query. So, I just want to do a select star from my universe as of a particular point in database time and system time. And then I need to keep lots of versions stuff around. So I can just say, well, I'll show you what this thing looked like as of a particular point in time. 
And that's kind of cool. That's like part of the SQL recent spec. They call it system time. It's as old system time. Datomic is a, a tool that really embraces this. It's pretty cool. And it's spreading. Lots of databases have this capability now uh, to have these point in time queries. So what is bi-temporality? So I think we, we set the scene there. So what we saw with that as of is basically what this is like the most fundamental unit called transaction time. And transaction time is basically, uh, this is a you know, formal definition, but it's basically when a fact is inserted into the database. It's when that database records and sees the fact. And transaction time is always increasing. So, so you cannot insert into transaction time past. It's immutable. And that's a good thing, because if we do a query as of a particular transaction time, we're going to get consistency for that query. We can do it again the next day and get the exact same results. So it's, it's good news. It's a good story. But by temporality, it's saying, like, this is not enough. We need valid time as well. And in the next couple of slides, before Jeremy introduces Crux, I'll just quickly make the case as to why valid time is needed. So valid time is not when the fact is recorded by the database. Valid time is when a fact is true. It's a bit more lofty, it's a bit more abstract. This fact is true at this particular point in time. And the nice thing about valid time, you see my little diagrams at the top of the bottom, that's a shame. Um, even worse now. Uh, so you can see that, let's pretend like you've got three transactions that hit this database of ours. So transaction time is always increasing. So that arrow at the bottom is always increasing. Well, valid time is more flexible. You can insert into the valid time past. And that's the key thing about valid time. You can update the valid time past. And then it turns out that, yes, we've got transaction time that's useful for the audit and the immutability. But well, valid time tends to be what the business cares more about querying, because it offers that flexibility, the ability to enrich the past. So when we do an as of queries, if we've got valid time, we can have a more flexible uh, time period. So hence, you can do something like this. You can say, as of valid time and transaction time, as of these bitemporal coordinates. So if you think about it, you get the best of both worlds here. You, you get the valid time, which the business care more about, because you can enrich the past, you can do things. Um, but then you can add, and this is optional, you can just uh, do this by the time you want to. But then if you add transaction time, you get that consistency of query. The app of this query will never change for a given transaction time. So when, when those two come together, it's like the, the beauty of by some priority. But just a couple of examples, I'm just going to review these. So let's say that we, you know, we want to solve this problem with two-way or pizza here at Everett. Um, so let's say we want to do a, a query which is like, as of right now, who is here? Yeah. Um, and then we can determine who, who was at eight or pizza. Uh, it's not the circuit, so it's like a future issue. But um, so we've got lots of data that have come in, like when you were registered, you swipe your cards and things, and we've recorded who, who has come in. But there might be somebody here that wants to register their presence tomorrow, which is at a point in future. Um, you know, beyond the right now. So this is a case where we don't, we're, we're, we're always enriching the past. So we're, we're, we, we add facts to the past, and that's why we want to query with this valid time, because it gives us that flexibility. If we've just got transaction time, then you, can, you, you just can't update or insert the past. You've got that transaction to work with, and that's it. Um, this is a more of an enterprise situation, and we've sort of seen this. So imagine you've got like this, global enterprise set up here, and you've got these different systems across the world, like APAC, New York, and EMEA, and you've got these front office systems, and let's say they're recording like trades or something, something important, and these, these bits of like, incredibly important bits of information, they appear, like they are created with a valid time, that's when they are true, that's when people want to query them, that's when people want to understand them. But then, those, those facts make their way through the, through, through the enterprise, you know, speed of light, and they get to our database, but then the time that they're transacting to the database, that can be later, so you get them jumbled up. Right? So if you query any transaction time, you're going to suffer that jumbled upness of these things coming in. Whereas if you query valid time, then you sort of solve this problem. 
Last example I want to, uh, to show is this idea of backfill. So again, if you want to preserve transaction time, something meaningful to query against, and transaction time is all you've got, and uh, you can't insert into the past, you can only ever go forward. What happens if you want to correct the past or move some data around? And we've had this situation where we imported the live slice of data first, but then at a future point in time, you want to insert the historical data. And if you're going to go forward in transaction time, it's sort of stuffed. So again, this by temporality, this valid time is like a get out of jail part. It gives you that flexibility. So you can do things like backfill, data arriving, slightly jumbled up, gives you all these things. It also makes a business uh, onto uh, queries. So hopefully I've made the case that we need some vital quality in our lives. And I'm going to pass over to yeah, Jeremy. To... So vital quality isn't a new concept. Show of hands indicate people have heard of it. Um, it's something that's been used and appreciated for like decades. But it's really only been in niche industries, financial services, insurance, where people have um, strong audit requirements, where they need to track um, sort of log of audits and, and then be able to query against that audit trail. So in, in this world, um, where we talk about transaction time, that's really um, gives you consistent query, but it also gives you auditability. Uh, and so that's mainly the, the areas where that temporality is, is used as a concept. Um, but I guess as we've moved into a world of you know, let's store all the data in our big data lakes and let's, let's, never, ne let's have an immutable data record uh, and we have these functional programming techniques, it's like how can we add time on top of this immutable uh, transaction time. So this sort of initial conception of bytemporality temporality um, you know, has been implemented. So um, yeah, DB2, Oracle, SQL Server, they have this bitemporal uh, capability, but it, it requires you to be upfront about in your schema design, I want this to be a temporal table. I want, this, I want this particular data to be tracked by temporary. Whereas we think that actually that's a huge barrier to adoption. And the reason why we're not all building by temporal systems is because the tools aren't simpler. Um, and therefore, I, I, I argue that it's an open problem. Um, you know, if you want to download Postgres and use by temporal queries, uh, you have to use an extension. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not like a mainstream thing. Um, and it has all these implications of query performance and that sort of thing, which is why we built uh, Crux. So Crux is a, a, a database product by, by Juxt. Um, we released it in, in April. Um, so it's been growing and growing and growing. And it's been incubated in the Clojure community. So hands up with Clojurists. Um, but uh, we think this, this concept of bi-temporality has huge application across anyone that does functional programming. Uh, so why did we build it? Well, we actually wanted something that was open source. So this is MIT license. Um, we wanted to build a solution for bi-temporality, which wasn't just ad hoc. We wanted to create something we could use, you know, different projects, uh, different use cases. So we wanted to build something that was going to scale. Um, and so we used building blocks, which we'll come on to, which do provide that scale. Uh, we really like data log. Uh, hands up who knows what data log is? A few people. Okay. Uh, so data log is a query language. Um, so it's like a simpler version of SQL. Gives you very powerful capabilities to do sort of graph queries. I'll give you some examples. Uh, the other thing we really wanted was eviction support. So um, uh, a lot of databases where you have this sort of immutable concept um, make it quite onerous and sort of inefficient to be removing data from your immutable record. And um, why would you want to do that? Well, sometimes you legally have to remove data. So we wanted to solve this problem of well, how do you use these immutable databases and also comply with the law. Um, so. Uh, sort of a, from a data model perspective, uh, Crux is somewhere between a document database and a graph database. And that graph database is somewhat an ambiguous term. And if anyone's looked into it, it's, uh, everyone just says Neo for J, uh, which is sort of, yeah, one, one definition. Um, but document database is the more interesting one because I think document um, inherently means schemaless. So document, a document database, you don't have to be upfront in the same as a graph database, but it also has these um, these properties of you know, being very easy to, to replicate things. So Crux is a, a document store which does graph indexing uh, in a bitemporal uh, way so that you can go uh, do point in time graph queries across your documents, if that makes sense. Um, and the way it does this is by, uh, I'll just come over here. So, um, so the various components within, within Crux, so on the left you have uh, topics. 
so or logs, um, which map to say Kafka topics. So we have a transaction uh, log, uh, document log, and what's actually happening is uh, within within internal in Crux, when you submit against the API, it's essentially using those topics, those Kafka topics, as a write ahead log, um, and then the information is uh, it's hashed, and so you can evict things from the document log. When the transactions get processed, and the documents get pulled, indexed, and put into uh, a combination of uh, indexes. And these indexes are pluggable, so actually you can, you can use uh, yeah, RocksDB or LMDB. So RocksDB is very good for ingestion, uh, so LMDB you know, could be really faster queries. Um, so it's a relatively simple model, and all of these arrows are closure protocols. So it's actually it's a very pluggable design, very modular design. Um, oh, and the other thing is, yeah, each node is sort of fully independent, so the, the only coordination going on is through the transaction topic. So this whole thing is built to, to scale, um, sort of at, at Kafka scale. Um, sorry. Uh, so, for example, um, there's a company out in the Netherlands who, who uh, we haven't really spoken to them or engaged them directly. Uh, they just found the GitHub page, looked at the docs, and they went and said, yeah, let's, let's, let's use Crux, and uh, actually, oh, we, we can't get Crux to work in Windows and RoxDB, so we're going to build our own um, key value store backend using um, uh, Exodus, which is a JVM only key value store. So they were able to build their own modules and get Crux working in, in production in, in their application, which is sort of a testament to not only the, the adoption of the open source community, but also the ease at which you can, you can build things in this modular design. Uh, and so this is a visualization of what, what, what you can do in, in, in Crux. So this is data log here on the left. Um, so there's a few things going on here. Uh, see these keywords, so find allows us to select different variables. And then inside where is a set of clauses. So here we have four clauses. Uh, and essentially those clauses are like pattern matching the entire database. They're trying to find every set of possible um, answers that, that make these four clauses evaluated to true. So if we go through it, E is looking at all the entities in the database, but only the ones that have ticket price, and then it's assigning that variable ticket price to P, and then it's using that P um, variable in uh, three um, predicates. So these are, these are just simple um, uh, comparators, and this one is a rule, which in data log allows you to do very complex things, and you can have recursive rules and do things like graph traversals inside the rules. So this, this rule is defined up here, and it's basically saying for a given um, ticker ID is the market in which the ticker trades in a particular currency. So you feed in the parameters, that's, uh, that's the parameter, this, this binds to the, 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 the E variable from up there. And so it's going to the, scan through the entire database, it uses um, a worst case optimal join algorithm to traverse all the indexes uh, using by temporal coordinates and find the results, and so the results there are right. And uh, you can see here you've got sort of the valid time, transaction time options, so you can use this interface as well for doing lookups, um, historical lookups. So that's a quick, quick ex explanation of data flow. Um, this uh, is another example of the kind of thing you can do with the console. And I'll just flip over to the console now. Do it in real, do it in real time. So, so this is the live console. In fact, if anyone wants to, you can go to console.crux.cloud, and this is basically a big collaborative sandbox. Um, so uh, right now, if I just rerun this query, uh, yeah, so that's live. Um, so yeah, you could do something like, um, actually, I'm only interested in uh, when the ticket price uh, is, uh, well, let's just change this. Well, so first of all, you could, you could lower this boundary, so instead of 80, it's going to be um, 70, and then therefore we'll expect this top line to drop off because that says 76. So when we run the query, sure enough, we're going to get the three results back. Um, but equally, if we just go to console.crux.cloud, so let's get rid of this back to the home, and if I run this, uh, it's going to sh show us everything that's in this database. So um, because it's schemaless, we can see, sort of get a sense of what's in the, in the database and, and what, what kind of documents we have. Uh, we can also actually just look at the attribute frequencies and see we've got 1,000 documents. 
um, variety of attributes. And uh, what we can do now is actually just put a document. So right now we have uh, 1060 documents. And if we just create a new uh, document, so we're going to do a crux.txt put. And we'll get a document and we'll, we'll give it a crux ID of um, hello. Let's uh, get for Revolut. Short of work. And submit that. And uh, now, if I, uh, so I think I have to refresh the page to refresh the number of attributes, but I should say, yeah, 1061. And um, if we were to rerun the original query again, uh, back to the table view, we'll, we'll see it in our table with our new, um, hello, there you go. So, so now we can, we can actually navigate around this document, uh, this database. Um, so actually, if I just go back to that, you can see that you can click around and say, you know, show me all of the um, markets that operate in the USA country, and you can do that sort of thing as well. Um, and if anyone has, uh, did anyone transact? Did anyone go? No, I was allowed to that. That's fine. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is the console. So this is the way to interact with products uh, as a you know, someone that's not interested in closure necessarily, you just want to get the feel for the APIs and what you can do and what sort of data you can get. And there's some more complex examples as well. So if I want to uh, look, look at you know, how you could put uh, documents in at particular points in valid time, you can see that you know, within a single transaction you can put like a set of time series in there. So uh, if I actually have a look at these um, results again, you can see that you can click on um, say a certain ticker and then have a look at its uh, attribute history. Uh, and see how the value of the ticket price has changed uh, over the lifetime. Um, so yeah, this is this is uh, sort of a, still a pre-release of the, the console, but um, Crux has um, an HTTP API, it has a, a Java API, of course it has a Closure API as well. Uh, right now it only supports Eden documents, um, but it's very easy to translate JSON into, into Eden, into the Closure um, uh, data structure, data format. Um, and uh, the other key thing is, is it's embeddable. So uh, not only could you, you could just use Crux uh, as like a, just a, like a SQLite sort of thing, just embedded in your, in your process, locally to your machine. You don't have to use Kafka. You could also use a you know, JDBC, you know, use Aurora. Um, and the other thing is, because it's, uh, the indexes are embedded in process, it allows you to do this, this mishmash of, well, I'm going to do a bit of data log, I'm going to do, I'm going to take that database as a value, combine it with my graph algorithm, and do that very efficiently to, to implement you know, your sort of complex graph statistic um, traversals, the things you need to do uh, for those sorts of analytical use cases. Um, and that is about it. So I'm just going to return to the slides. Say so that's the GitHub page. Um, I'm Jeremy, John, it's been great having you. Um, yeah, any questions?